So, Jim, how much of a terpene is needed to have medical benefits? Well, look, that's a very a difficult question to answer in regards to you know a quantity or milligrams or gra- grams of these terpenes because everyone has a different need, has a different use for for and and is looking for a different effects. So really, it needs to be individualized. You need to be you know setting an intention, have a goal, have a specific. Thing, a specific outcome you're sort of measuring what what is what is effective and and then like with CBD and THC you know there is no set set number it's very much personalized so with all this stuff you start low you reflect you, you have a but you reflect on your baseline you reflect as you're increasing you have a goal and once your goal is reached, which might be, I want to get up, get off the lounge and feel like I'm able to do some exercise, you know, I want my pain to be reduced, but I also need to have enough energy and mental clarity to be able to do that. You know, you've got to set these, set these goals. Once that's reached, then, you know, that's, that's how much you need, but that's going to be different for, for everyone. So it's just about formulating a process rather than having a specific set quantity. Um, and, and if something doesn't work for you, you know, then, then, then change it up, mix, mix it up and, 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 and see, mm. and see how your body sort of responds. And it might not be always increasing the amount that you have. You might sometimes decrease the amount to have a, a more profound effect because a lot of these terpenes and cannabinoids, they have bi-directional, biphasic, multiphasic effects. And what happens with that product at one concentration is going to be different to what happens at, at another. So that's my general general rules, I guess, around anything sort of cannabis related is that you should use as much as you need and use no more. Mm-hmm. And look, uh, I, I personally, I completely agree with that. However, the people that are watching this are doctors and you guys are a prickly bunch and you want exact <laughs> milligram doses, which, you know, studies on terpenes in humans still remain scarce and exact dosages are really difficult to, to ascertain because... They're highly bioactive. They generally do not require large doses to produce a physiological response. I mean, if you've ever just inhaled, um, you know, something walking through the street or just a drop of lavender under your pillow, that's a really intense smell. And that, mm. is, in, for, for many people, is enough to put them to sleep. So we don't need to go above and beyond in this situation. Um, but again, the exact uh, milligram dosages from terpene to terpene will vary. And some terpenes are going to be um, far more tolerable than others as well. So like limonene, for example, um, th- dosages of up to two grams a day have been safe in humans. Uh, whereas linalool, you know, we have a, a therapeutic dose between sometimes five milligrams up to maybe 120 milligrams. Um, something like uh, campfine or humulene, uh, that's something where we, we don't need these massive um, dosages. And in higher doses above you know, 1,000 milligrams have shown um, you know, strong irritant effects. I mean, these are, in many cases, solvents. Uh, if you mm-hmm. limonene or something in a dose of a couple hundred milligrams has shown some really fantastic results against peptic ulcers. Um, but if you were to have you know, maybe five grams of linalool or limonene, then essentially you're putting a solvent into your body. Yes, we don't want to break down those uh, inherent barriers that are there to, to protect us. So, mm. you know, you've got to use all these things with, with caution and, and have measurable sort of outcomes that you're sort of working towards mm-hmm. as well. Start low, go slow, utilize the composition that's present naturally within the plant. Um, so that brings us on to smoking versus vaporizing because... These two different methods of administration will have um, very different effects. Um, Mm -hmm. The reason is the boiling points of the compounds within cannabis. So uh, terpenes, again, light, very fragile, volatile. They have a fairly low boiling point. So if you apply um, flame and heat and straight up combustion to a plant with these small volatile chemicals in it, you're going to degrade and destroy them in the process without uh, really getting to enjoy their their therapeutic or potential therapeutic effects. Um, Mm -hmm. So by using a vaporizer, we can be deliberate with a temperature setting and we can elicit a, a, a the desired effect, the desired experience from the plant that you have. So if you look at the certificate of analysis, assess the terpene profiles, match those up with their boiling points, and then decide, all right, so uh, pinene, that's a boiling point of about 155 Celsius. So if I need to be super, super functional, if I maybe want to use a cannabis and a vaporizer for um, maybe a bit of mood stability and focus, if I have ADHD, then I'm going to utilize a really, really low temperature 
um, so that I can elicit that pinene without destroying it. Some of the most common terpenes and their boiling points are humulene at 107 degrees Celsius, alpha pinene at 155 degrees Celsius, beta caryophyllene at 165, D-limonene 176, eucalyptol at 176, terpinolene at 185, and linalool at 198 degrees Celsius. So again, being deliberate with your temperatures and eliciting the experience that you want from the compounds within that uh, temperature uh, spectrum. So Cam, um, I just would like to get some uh, further information about, I guess, what, what gives these different terpenes their different boiling points. And I've heard people talk about monoterpenes and sesquiterpenes and diterpenes. And I, I, from my understanding, these, these, whether, whether they've got these different sort of structures, you know, might increase the volatility of that particular terpene. So can you just take us through that? Certainly. So um, when we're talking about terpenes, they're comprised of hydrocarbon so uh, those carbon rings determine whether a terpene is a monoterpene, a sesquiterpene, or a diterpene. So a monoterpene it contains 10 carbons, and they're considered the most volatile, the most fragile. They're the smallest molecules. Um, those, some monoterpenes include uh, uh, limonene and pinene. Uh, sesquiterpenes, mm -hmm. such as beta caryophyllene, they contain 15 carbons. And then we have diterpenes, diterpenes, such as phytol, they contain 20 carbons. And then triterpenes containing 30 carbons. And so those are going to be bigger molecules, generally have a little bit more stability, less volatility, and generally a higher boiling point. So mono okay. down one end of the spectrum is going to be the smallest, most fragile, most volatile, lower boiling points in general. And then down the other end of the spectrum, we have the triterpenes, which are going to have the most carbon rings, and they're going to have the generally a little bit of a higher boiling point. Okay. And also with that volatility, does that change? Does the terpene profile of the plant change with the age of the plant as well and, and, the, and the curing process? Is that something we need to be considering when, when looking at these terpene, terpene profiles on, on the plant versus the batch and how long it's been there for? Certainly. So again, terpenes are really, really fragile. Um, uh, they, they need to be treated gently. Uh, so even you know, rough shaking of a cannabis product, like such as a uh, you know, raw plant material, that's going to disrupt those, those gentle little um, terpenes and essentially allow them to disperse into the air where they can degrade. Uh, any kind of heat can degrade a cannabis plant over time. So you'll notice that uh, um, cannabis plants that are stored incorrectly, maybe they've been in a glass jar on a shelf or something, they're going to lose some of their, their vibrancy in the flavonoids as they degrade. So it might go from a, like a nice vibrant green to something that resembles um, kind of a sandy, earthy color. And in that same process, you're going to be losing those terpenes. And so um, as that moisture content degrades, as the, ter as the cannabis ages, goes through um, you know, various uh, heat cycles due to environmental factors, then you do lose a lot of that terpene concentration over time. And you know, incorrect uh, curing processes as well. Um, if, uh, if a plant is, is cured incorrectly, maybe in a room that's too warm or too cold, you're also going to uh, potentially jeopardize that, uh, that terpene integrity. Oh, it really is a very nuanced medicine and, and it is something that is constantly sort of changing throughout its sort of life cycle as well. You've given us a good uh, indication of the, you know, the terpenes as a whole and how they might influence the plant. Can you just sort of take us through the top five terpenes and their you know, more pronounced obvious uh, effects as well? Certainly. So pinene, personally one of my favorites, but the pinene is a monoterpene. Um, it's one of the most abundant terpenes within nature. It's found in basil, um, cedar, conifer trees, eucalyptus, parsley, rosemary, and hundreds of other plants. And pinene, its aroma smells like its namesake, which is pine. Um, so Preclinical studies, which I'm going to be mentioning, it just assume that everything that I talk about is preclinical. Um, but preclinical studies indicate that pinene has a strong anti-inflammatory activity via the prostaglandin E1, um, acetylcholinesterase in inhibition, which we spoke about, which is going to increase the acetylcholine levels in the brain and potentially mitigate some of those uh, short-term memory loss effects or deficits induced by THC. Um, pinene is also a bronchodilator in humans as well, even at a low exposure. So a deep breath in a pine forest, there's a reason you feel elevated. You're, you're, it's bronchodilator. You're getting in more oxygen um, simply through the, uh, the, the natural concentrations in the air around you. Um, and then pinene also has some anxiolytic effects at benzodiazepine GABA receptors. Um, going on to myrcene, another really, really common one. And again, the, uh, the, 
differentiator between whether a plant is classically sativa or classically indica. So higher concentrations of myrcene generally is going to be an indica chemovar. But myrcene is a monoterpene found commonly in hops, lemongrass, thyme, and abundantly within traditional indica flowers. So uh, myrcene's aroma is often described as a kind of earthy, musky smell, kind of like cloves. Um, preclinical research again indicates um, effects such as anti-inflammatory via the prostaglandin E2. Um, anti-carcinogenic activity against a uh, flight aflatoxin in the liver, um, long-lasting analgesia involving A2 adrenoceptors and opioid receptors, uh, muscle relaxation and sedat sedative effects likely through uh, the PPAR receptors, um, uh, prevention of peptic ulcers with increased mucus production, decreased levels of superoxide dismutase, and increased levels of glutathione. And then potentially the prevention of isemic um, reperfusion oxidative injury. Uh, then we go on to limonene. So limonene is mm -hmm. a monoterpene found in large concentrations in citrus plants. Um, again, a, a aroma that is like its namesake. It's citrusy, it's sweet, it's lemony, but without the sharpness of, of you know, a citrus plant. Um, limonene, is, limonene is really high bioavailability, rapid metabolism, and low toxicity. As I said, it's one of those terpenes that's a, a tolerated up to uh, two grams a day. Um, but limonene, strong anxiolysis uh, mediated by the 5-HT1A receptors, uh, can boost serotonin levels in the prefrontal cortex and dopamine in the hippocampus. Um, we have increased mouse motility by about 32% after inhalation and decreased activity after caffeine by 33%. Uh, so again, we have some of these biphasic uh, effects happening in front of us. Uh, prominent antibiotic effects, many terpenes do have some prominent antibiotic effects, mm -hmm. uh, induction of apoptosis in breast and colon cancer cells, uh, agonistic activity at the A2A adenosine receptors, uh, reduced hyperalgesia, increased mitochondrial biogenesis, significant anti-ulcer properties, and paired with some gastroprotectant properties. Um, then we come on to another really popular terpene, and rightly so, is linalool. So linalool is a monoterpene present in lavender, coriander, rose, basil, and other botanicals. And uh, it's also one of the primary therapeutic agents within lavender, uh, which is why lavender is mm. such a soothing plant. Well, it's because it's, uh, that, that linalool is going straight, again, for your GABA receptors, uh, providing some uh, anxiolytic effects there. Linalool has also been touted as an anticonvulsant, anticlutamatergic, uh, promotion of axonal regeneration. Uh, it's an antihyperlipidemic, uh, antibacterial, antifungal, and then has a, a minor to moderate um, anesthetic properties, probably comparable to procaine and menthol. And then we have um, one of my favorites again, uh, beta caryophyllene. So beta caryophyllene, or BCP for short, is a sesquiterpene, um, commonly found in clove, black pepper, hops, thyme, and high levels within cannabis. It's a really sharp and peppery uh, aroma with some light, sweet notes behind it. Uh, it's really a beautiful smell, but uh, BCP, the reason why it's so fascinating is because it's a, a selective and strong full agonist at the CB2 receptor as well as an agonist at the PPAR receptor, uh, lending it the title, a unique title, as a dietary cannabinoid. So it is a cannabinoid that can be found within the foods that we eat. Um, so in terms of its uh, potential therapeutic effects, we're talking it's uh, showing anything that has something to do with CB2 receptors, so inflammatory arthritis, nervous system diseases, um, atherosclerosis, uh, streptococcus infections, osteoporosis, seizures, hepatic injury associated with oxidative stress, inflammation, and steosis, and uh, potentially nausea. Um, and then we have a few other terpenes here. Now, these ones, again, we're getting into an area where these terpenes are less common and certainly less common <clears throat> in large enough concentrations to be um, clinically meaningful or significant. Again, we don't know what some of those numbers are, what, how much of a terpene makes it clinically, clin clinically meaningful. Uh, but we have terpinaline, another monoterpene found predominantly in parsnips and pine varieties. Mm -hmm. um, again, parsnips, it's, it's a bit of a uh, sharp uh, and sweet and peppery smell again. Um, so it, terpinaline shows sedative effects in mice. Um, however, in humans, it demonstrates some um, stimulating effects. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, it's a pretty divisive terpene. Some people respond really, really well, and it helps with their anxiety. For some people, it can induce anxiety. Um, it's also antifungal, uh, larvicidal, and an antineoplastic activity at high concentrations. Uh, then we have humulene, which is a sesquiterpene found in hops and sage and ginseng and cannabis. Um, it's got a subtle aroma, uh, more described as like an earthy, woody, with a little bit of spice. Um, humulene is also known as 
alpha karyophyllene. So it's a, a ring opened isomer of beta karyophyllene, just lacking the CB2 activity. Uh, little is known about its pharmacology, to be honest. Uh, some studies have demonstrated antineoplastic properties in vitro against breast and colon cancer cells and in vitro and vivo activity against um, hepatocellular carcinoma. And then the final one we have today is osamine. Now, osamine is a highly abundant monoterpene predominantly found in basil and hops, lavender, orchids, and pepper, uh, commonly used in the perfume industry. If you've ever put on some cologne, yeah, most likely you've had a little bit of osamine in there, especially for male perfume or whatever you want to call that. Um, sweet floral aroma, a little bit of peppery spice behind it. Um, osamine, again, rarely been studied in isolation. Um, however, essential oils high in osamine have demonstrated anticonvulsant, antifungal, and antiviral properties. Wow, Cam. Thank you very much for all of your knowledge there. And it does just show how complex, you know, based on just the, just the effects of the, the, the terpenes alone in their individual form, how complex cannabis is as a medicine and the wide ranging sort of effects it can have in the body and the importance of maintaining the integrity of that, of that whole plant in, in the preparations to, to get that sort of diverse physiological activity with, within the body. And I can see that you're very keen on, keen on a lot of terpenes there. Um, and also interesting, you raised that point about terpinaline because I, it was my understanding that the terpinaline level is often one of the strongest predictors of whether something is a classical sativa strain mm -hmm. and sativas in general are very divisive because some people love them and some people find them very anxiety provoking as well. So I think that's a very interesting, interesting point you raised there. Thank you. Look, folks, if I told you that I understood it all, I'd be lying to you, <laughs> but we're all trying to figure it out together.